always a camera in my face. That's one of the difficulties. This is not a joke, a true story. You know, over in Australia, it's much warmer than here in UK. And so during the warm weather, we always have lots of flies. So one day in our centre in Perth, Western Australia, I was teaching what to do if a fly lands on you during the meditation. And if a fly lands on you during meditation, you don't need to sort of brush it away. Or <laughs> All the flies are very clean in Western Australia. Not only they're clean, but they're very Buddhist. They're Buddhist flies. That's where they come to the Buddhist center. And I know this to be true because after giving some advice on what to do if a fly wants to explore your nose, they just go out for a little bit, go on one side, come out the other side to see what's there, and they leave you alone afterwards. But anyway, because you have a camera on you, that when just after I finished the introductory talk, a fly landed on me and the camera was on me, I couldn't do my usual response of <laughs> <laughs> I had to endure it. And if you just endure and don't try to control things, it's amazing what insights you get. What insight I got is when the fly landed just under my nose, then it started walking around my mouth. <laughs> and I, oops, crash. Okay. What I noticed was that the most sensitive parts of your mouth are just on the edges. Once they get past that, it's much less irritation. So they walked around and went to the other edge of the mouth, it was irritating again, and then back to under my nose. And then that fly continued. It went round three times. <laughs> In Buddhism, we call that circumambulation. If you go to any Buddhist country on a ceremony, they go around a big Buddha statue or stupa three times. And so after it finished the third time, went back to its beginning, that's when it flew off. And I realized all the fly was wanting to do was pay respect to my mouth. <laughs> circumambulation, that's called a Buddhist fly. Do you believe that? <laughs> How about Buddhist snakes? Why? You, snakes are nice. I was told this story not long ago here in UK, that in the morning, like everybody else, you get up and go to the toilet, but in the forest, you usually go to the toilet in the bush. And then, to go to the toilet, the Asian style, you don't stand up, you squat. So I was squatting, it was the first light, so it was still quite dark, and I thought I was peeing on a stick. But then you, <laughs> it's like very dim light. And after I started peeing on the stick, the stick started to move. I realized I was urinating on a snake, a very dangerous snake and one of the most sensitive parts of the male anatomy was just inches from its mouth. <laughs> That's very, very scary. But was I scared? No way. Because all the snakes over in Thailand, they're all Buddhist too. So when it was being peed on by a Buddhist monk, it thought that it was being blessed with holy water. Have you ever seen the monks in these Thai monasteries blessing you with holy water? You can't get more holy than straight, straight from the body of a good monk. So that snake enjoyed every moment of having a shower and then it very calmly went away. It would never bite you. It's almost time. Start. Can't do another story joke. Okay. <laughs> what? I'm just trying to make sure everyone's got a seat. Okay. Everyone's got a seat. Okay, there's one over here. It's free. There's quite a few cushions on the floor over here. There's lots of spare seats. Are there? I don't know. Excellent.
Okay, so shall we start? Okay, my name is Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> That's spelled B for Buddhist, R for Roman Catholic, A for Anglican, H for Hindu, and M for Muslim. We try, <laughs> we try and make it sort of fair for everybody. There's no religion starting with a V, is there? V? Oh, we can invent one. Okay, yeah, come on. I don't mind. Are you from MI5? <laughs> <laughs> she denies it. MI6, okay. You know, sometimes I have fun when you go through security, because I travel a lot. In US, this is absolutely true, they saw me and they say, what have you got under your robe? <laughs> so, is it a suicide belt? Because when you wear robes, sometimes in those days, people think you've got a suicide belt and blow up the aircraft. And I replied, no, this is not a suicide belt, it's just fat. <laughs> and the guy said, same thing. <laughs> <laughs> You're allowed to laugh, come on, let go. <laughs> okay, anyway, so you want meditation instead of jokes? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, you asked for it. You should have put like half an hour jokes, half an hour meditation. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't. Okay. So anyway, uh, this is Venerable Chanda. We're doing 20 minutes of meditation. I will guide the first few minutes and then let you go so you can meditate how you wish. But please, you know, because there's many people here, please no levitation. <laughs> please sit to, stick to the chair. Honestly, the, one of the first times I taught meditation, to a group in prisons, had over 110 people came from the jail I was teaching in. That's about almost everybody. And after just a few minutes, someone put their hand up, and it's a really big guy, very violent, scars all over him, maybe about six, five, six, six in size. And he said, it's okay to ask a question. When anybody that size interrupts you, you always say, yes, sir. <laughs> How could... And he said, is it really true? Is it really true that through meditation you can learn how to fly over walls? <laughs> this was in a jail. And when I said it takes many, 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 many years and only sort of very skilled people can actually do stuff like that, so it's unlikely you can, then the next time I taught in jail only three people turned up. <laughs> That's true. Anyway, okay, let's uh, behave now. Shall I behave? Nah. Do you want to control it? Indeed. It? With your mind as well. Don't try and control your mind. Let your mind be. Totally different thing. Look. I do the big thing. This water. The job of meditation is learning how to keep things perfectly still. Does this stop moving yet? I'm not mindful, am I? I'm mindful now. <laughs> My intention is to keep this still, but it keeps moving. Why? I'm mindful, but I'm not concentrating. <laughs> I really am. It moves even more. How do I keep this perfectly still? Many of you have seen me do this before. You put it down. You let it go. You detach. You stop holding things. Look how still that is. Effortless. Please, in meditation, do not be a control freak. You get tired and you find you're always failing. So, have some more people coming in? Okay, go, hi. Please come in, find a seat. There's a seat somewhere. The mosh pit is still plenty of spaces up here. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so we start meditating. Please close the eyes. It'll be 20 minutes. And with the eyes closed, it means that your brain has more capacity to be able to be mindful of your body 
and your mind. Sometimes the sense of sight takes so much space, we're hardly aware of anything else. Now you can close your eyes and it's safe here. You don't need to peek. And with your eyes closed, it's one of the five senses that have been turned off. The sense of smell and uh, taste, easy to turn off. The sense of hearing, you just hear my voice. But when I stop speaking, you'll find it's very quiet in here. It's a great venue. See if you can listen to the silence. Where the sound, they've got so much space surrounding it. And that silence I always found very attractive. It pulls you in. It's a place where you can rest. Where you don't have to form evaluations, judgments, plans. Silence calms everything down. And in the silence, the closer you are to the present moment, the more silent it is. As for the past, you cannot change the past. You don't even learn from the past. People just pick up things from the past, like picking up old memories, which they choose to disturb themselves. You learn much more from the present moment than you can ever learn from the past. And as for your future, your plans of what you're going to do next, please understand that your future is being made right now, in this moment. If you care for your future, care for the present moment, the place where your future is built. And as you come into the present moment more and more, why can't we stay in this moment? Why do we always tend to abandon it, to think of things which aren't really important, or to plan things which never happen? Instead, we learn how to be kind to this moment called now. The kindness is befriending the present moment. This moment called now becomes your best friend. You can hang out together without any force. You chill out together because you're attracted together. Me and now. In silence and kindness. Whatever meditation you have, whatever object you usually watch, that can come up if it wants to, but you don't choose. Whatever you are aware of right now, whatever that is, please give that importance. The most important meditation object is that which is right in front of you right now. And the most important thing to do is to open the door of your heart to this moment. <coughs> to let it be. With no judgment, no wanting, no trying to get rid of. Being kind to it. And after a few moments, the mind gets even more peaceful.
You're not trying to watch something. You're just being here. You're resisting the temptation to change things or go somewhere else. See if you can develop the perception of being happy to be here. This is good enough. If that becomes your underlying attitude, you find the mind calms down and it feels the first signs of joy being here. You really are happy to be here with nowhere to go, nothing to do. Peace in your heart. I'm going to be quiet now and leave you to enjoy the peace and the silence. See where it takes you. When I speak again, it will just be before the end of the meditation.
Uh, it's now coming close to the end of the meditation. How do you feel? How pleasant is it to be able to start an evening just by sitting quietly and relaxing our body and mind to the max? Something simple, but very effective. So now I invite you to open your eyes to end the meditation. <coughs> Excellent. Very good. So again, thank you all for not levitating following <laughs> my suggestions. <laughs> so anyway, the talk title this evening is about fear and anxiety. And you probably, those who have known me for a long time, now I'm a very, very anxious monk, <laughs> really full of fear. <laughs> and basically, you look at such things as fear and anxiety, there seem to be no point to them. Even things like Somebody once said the most fearful thing to do is to give a talk in public. I do this all the time. I've really been waiting for years for people to hate one of my talks so much that I can retire, I don't need to give a talk again. Wouldn't that be lovely? <laughs> Sometimes I even thought like that. I thought, if I give a really, really, really bad talk, then I won't need to go travelling anymore. I can relax in a monastery. I'm over 72 now, old enough to retire. But can I retire? Sure. Sure, OK. <laughs> <laughs> but when people started saying that one of the scariest, scariest things to do is to talk in public, you know, one of the times, one of the times I gave a really big talk was in Singapore. There was about 3,000, 4,000 people. And they all came in the evening just to listen to me. No B act, no supporting group, just up on a stage, on a chair, give a talk, followed by questions and answers. Amazing, I wasn't scared, but I thought, this is dangerous. If you talk to so many people, and they like it, you get a really big, colossal ego. And then I started thinking that actually, whenever I give a talk, I don't give a talk. The person or the people giving the talk is all the teachers I've listened to over the years, all the people I've learned from over the years. And there's so much truth in that. My job when I'm teaching is just to let go to kind of disappear and just let all these teachings come out. And it's not just me giving the talk. Honestly, it's every one of you. That's why I, please excuse me, but I like to keep eye contact when I'm giving a talk. Because when I get eye contact with you, it's like, you know, you're giving me some feedback and finding out whether this is really what you want, what you expect, how you like it. And you help me give the talk. It's so one of the reasons why when I mean, sometimes people ask me to please give a deep talk on anxiety and fear. And sometimes I just cannot do that. And the reason is because of you. You're not ready for it yet. At other times you are ready for it and the talk comes out really easily. A lot of the times giving a talk is not me lecturing you. It's the teacher, the talker, connecting with you and seeing what you need. And this is actually how I've often given talks, which means in big communities, small communities, you can give a talk and enjoy. I was talking to someone just on the way here. The one of the talks I once gave was at like a keynote address at a big conference in South Korea, in uh, the 2000 something, World Computer Conference, 
in South Korea, in Taejeon. And there, I was given a keynote address to all these executives, ex experts on computing, including cybersecurity for the European Union, had a nice chat with him. But then they asked me, you're a Buddhist monk, are you a computer expert? No. Now what are you doing here? And one of the things I said, I think it was about 1912 or something, in the World Conference, no, World, World Exhibition in St. Louis in 1912, it just so happened that the person who was selling ice cream, because they had to feed all the people going to this World Exhibition, the person selling ice cream was just sighted right next to the person who was selling, um, selling waffles. And of course, being together for so many days, they got a friendship together, and they thought two different types of food, ice cream and waffles, how can we combine them? And that was the origin of the, the ice cream cone. So Louis World's Fair just so happened two totally different food types were next to each other. So every time you eat an ice cream cone, it's like an ice cream in a waffle. So that's what I said. I'm a Buddhist monk, you're computer experts. Let's see what comes out of this. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing which I did say, which I think you'll be interested in, was part of, well actually all business depends on innovation. And that's one thing as a Buddhist monk can be an expert in. Innovation. What is innovation? Okay, I'm going to pick up something, one of the glasses. Thank you. What is this? Come on, let me know. Is that all it is? What else is it? What else? What else? What else? What else? What else? What else? You're getting there. Every time if I'm sitting up here leading this discussion, people always assume there's a correct answer. And it's not trying to find out what the correct answer is and so I can give you a prize once you get the correct answer. There is no correct answer, obviously. But the longer you look, the more you see. And innovation, this is what it takes to have a problem, just whatever this is. What is it? What is it? What is it? You keep looking deeper and deeper and deeper. And the longer you look without thinking you've captured the meaning of this, the longer you look, the more you see and the more you understand. That's called innovation. You see things which other people haven't seen. You see things which you've never been taught before, which is beyond what you've been taught by before. And I said, that's what I can do for you, also in the World Computer Conference. So that was actually really neat. They liked it, because they never expected that. Because <laughs> <And so laughs> I'm hopeless at computing, as you, know, you well know. But nevertheless, you know, they gave me business class airfare from Australia to Korea, a $2,000 honorarium for going there. As they say in London, a nice little earner for someone who doesn't know what they're talking about, <laughs> which was true. <laughs> so these are little things about how we can use different attitudes to solve problems, have fun, and actually help many things in the world. But today about anxiety and fear. One of the stories which made a huge difference to me with how to deal with anxiety and fear was from the great Buddhist master, I'm sure you've read this, uh, this great Buddhist book before. It kind of deserves to be in the suttas somewhere, but it's not, called Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> Do you remember? Actually, yeah, Winnie the Pooh. He was walking back from Rabbit's house 
having had a little something, walking back with his best friend, little Piglet, and as they were walking together through the woods on the way home, a big storm arose. And as that storm arose, the trees started to sway. Branches fell off. Big branches came crashing down to the floor. And even trees were uprooted by the force of the storm and crashed around them. I heard that you've had big storms in UK recently. Is that the case? If you were within them at the time, were you scared? Well, little piglet was scared. Little people are always more scared than big people. As for me, if I fell over, I say I've got much padding to protect me. <laughs> I always thought if ever I fall over on my tummy, I just bounce back up straight away. <laughs> I'm not going to demonstrate it. <laughs> but anyway, little piglet was getting more and more scared and kept grabbing onto to Winnie the Pooh's paw until little piglet said, I can't go on any further. What would happen if a tree fell when we were underneath it? Which was a possibility. And at that, that Winnie the Pooh got scared. But just for a second. And then his innate wisdom came up and he said, what would happen if a tree didn't fall when we were underneath it? And that took away all the fear. And they walked home safely. A probability theory meant that they were more than likely to get home early, safely. You may think that's just a silly story. But years and years ago, in Perth, I was invited to speak at a group, not a computer science, but cancer survivors. And the cancer survivors, one of them asked me a question at the end of my little presentation. And they said that they were a survivor of breast cancer. It was very, very severe, and very, very painful. You have to have a, a breast removed. And she said, my, I'm in recession now. What would happen if that breast cancer came back? I don't think I can tolerate it again. That's what she asked me. My answer was, and I wasn't just uh, dismissing her concerns. My answer was, what would happen if that cancer didn't come back? And she smiled at me. And I've been going back to that Cancer Support Association every year for about the last 38 years. Every year, and they come and visit our monastery once a year. And she keeps coming back every year. And she told me that the cancer never came back, but I came back. She said, you didn't realize just how much that meant to me. The fear was something that dominated her and she couldn't even uh, look at the possibility it wasn't going to come back. But she thanked me enormously. Now sometimes simple answers to complex questions can be the best. Why is it, whatever we're afraid of or anxious of, why is it that we're so afraid and anxious? What happens if it goes wrong? Try that answer first of all, what happens if it doesn't? For someone who suffered from cancer, worry and anxiety, what would happen if it gets worse or comes back again? That creates so much stress in your mind. Of course it's going to come back again. You're increasing the probability of its return. But if you can somehow think, what would happen if it didn't? The story, a very old story of mine, which is incredibly powerful, was what I call the two bad bricks in a wall story. It's for 40 years, over 40 years, I've been staying in Western Australia. If you want to know why I'm there, 
I made a resolution when I was a young monk. Ajahn Chah was my teacher. Wherever he sent me, I would go. Whenever he asked me to come back, I would come back. Forty years ago, he sent me to Perth, Western Australia. A couple of weeks after he sent me there, he had a stroke and couldn't talk anymore. So I've been stuck there for, <laughs> <laughs> for 40 years. <laughs> and that's true. <laughs> Happily stuck there. <laughs> but anyhow, that sometimes that when I first go to a place like Western Australia, we had no money at all. So I had to, the first night over in this monastery in Western Australia, I had to sleep on the ground, just like a kangaroo does. The ground is not level, it's cold, but still you survived, I was young. And anyhow, when we started building, we didn't have any money to afford builders. I had to learn how to lay bricks. You know what I was before I was a monk? Theoretical physics at the other place. <laughs> you know what the other place is, don't you? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> so a theoretical physicist to being a bricklayer is quite a change. But it doesn't matter. You tried your very best to make sure that every brick was perfect before you went on to the next one. And when I finished my first brick wall, and like you always do, you look back upon it and see you know, how wonderful it is and give yourself a pat on the back. But when I looked at it, there were two bricks, only two, they were crooked. They spoiled the whole wall. <coughs> and I tried to remove the mortar around them so I could change them. I couldn't, the mortar was so hard. So the other monk with me, I asked, can we afford some dynamite? I did. I, I wanted to blow that wall up so I can start again. But we couldn't. I was stuck with the ugliest wall I'd ever seen. Two crooked bricks spoiled everything. And I was so traumatized by that, I would dream of that in the evening at night time. I would have nightmares. When any visitors came, I'd make sure I took them around so they could take them somewhere else. They couldn't see my mistakes. I was embarrassed. Until one day, one man was with me and they saw that wall and they said that was a beautiful wall. And my response was, are you blind? Are you, are you visually impaired? Have you left your, left your spectacles in the car? Can't you see those two crooked bricks? And what they said, I mentioned this earlier, hit me like a brick. <laughs> it's not, not a very good joke, is it? No, okay. <laughs> it's a dad joke. Oh, that's bad dad joke. I'm not a dad, I've got no kids. <laughs> they don't behave. <laughs> anyway, they said it's a beautiful wall. And he was right. Every time I thought of that wall, every time I looked at it, my eyes would just go to my two mistakes. I was a fault finder. Whenever I looked at it, I'd see what was wrong in it. Now that, uh, when I was a young man, he had girlfriends, whenever I had a girlfriend, I'd see her faults. Whenever I looked at myself, I saw my faults. I was a fault finder. And in a wall which had 998 good bricks and only two bad bricks, I could see those faults all the time. That negativity was unreasonable. But once I saw that, <coughs> I could let it be. The man was right, it was a beautiful wall. And believe it or not, it's still there. And I was telling Venerable Chanda, she goes to visit Perth very often. If you want to see it, you can't because it's in the monk's toilet block. <laughs> don't want to see it. <laughs> no, you don't. But it's there anyway. But why is it that we look at even the future and we saw the two bad bricks in the future? What might go wrong in the future? Never what might go right. Which is usually much more likely. 
This is one of the reasons why when we cultivate a negative mind, that's where we get fear and anxiety from. The answer is, you know, to what happens if it goes wrong? What happens if it goes right? This is practical wisdom, and I say this because the time when I was uh, a student doing final exams at Cambridge in theoretical phys physics, any theoretical physicists here? Scientists? Yeah, good. What are you doing? Um, I'm passing to Tony now, but I, I just study physics. Okay, yeah. Well, when you went to the final exams in those days, that was 1972, we had six days of papers, three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. That was really tough. But I had an advantage on, over all the other students. I'd learned how to meditate. So what happened to me, we were, had one hour for lunch. I never had any lunch. I had a big breakfast, big dinner. I was a lay person then. Big breakfast, big dinner. And at lunchtime, I just go back to my room, sat on a cushion, and meditated for half an hour. And this is what happened. When you sat down, the first thing which came into my mind was not my breath. The first thing which came into my mind was the morning exam. You review it, it's totally stupid. You make a good answer, a bad answer, it's already in. You can't change it now, it's finished with. And all the worry of the past just takes away your energy for facing the present and the future. So I could soon let that go because I'd already trained in meditation. The next thing which came into my mind was the afternoon exam. Should I get up from my seat and just go through a few books, remember a few formula? I thought, no. Worry about the future always drains your energy. And by that time I'd figured out whatever you revise half an hour before you're doing your exam never, never, never comes up in the paper. <laughs> Complete waste of time. <laughs> so, instead I let go of the future. And I came into the present moment. Simple but very powerful and effective. As soon as I came into the present moment, it was surprising. There I was sitting in my room, a young man, good, I was good at maths, that was my subject. Theoretical physics was basically maths. And so, the next thing which came into my mind was my body was shaking. What really surprised me, I never believed that was possible. I never regarded myself as nervous. But this was final exams. I often comment, if only, if only I had known I was going to become a monk, <laughs> I wouldn't have worried at all. <laughs> so anyway, our body was shaking. How do you get rid of that anxiety? All you do is just be aware of it. When you're aware of it, awareness gives you uh, feedback. So when you're aware of it, you can try this, you can try that, see what works. And for me it was just simple kindness, relaxation. Okay body, come on, relax. Can you relax your shoulders right now? Yes, you've done it. You soon learn how to relax your body. And so then my body stopped shaking. And the last thing, in only half an hour's meditation, the last thing I noticed was how tired my brain was. That was another great insight. I'd just been doing some three hour paper in quantum mechanics or astrophysics of the galaxy or something stupid like that. And now, of course, my brain has to be tired. And the last thing I needed to do was to think and worry. Instead, I just let it be. I was kind to my brain. Give it a break, give it some stillness. And just, it just took 15 minutes of being quiet, being still, not worrying about anything. And all the energy of the brain came back. I was recharged. 
So when I went into the uh, exam in the afternoon, I always did well in the afternoon. And in fact, some of my friends at the time told me I was the only student smiling in the afternoon exam. They thought I was cheating. I guess I was. I knew something they didn't know, how to relax. And I've taught that for so many years. One of the last times I taught that was at uh, a Jewish school in Perth. The, uh, the rabbi there, he's a good mate of mine, Moshe Bernstein. And he became a mate when I was talking to him about Buddhism and the differences. And he said, oh, we believe in reincarnation as well, rebirth. I said, are you sure about that? You're a Jewish person. I didn't think Jewish people believed in rebirth. He said, oh, yes, we do. When I later saw one of the senior rabbis, he said, well, yeah, well, actually, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> and that got Rabbi Moshe Bernstein up in my estimation. Now, he would think for himself. Which, you know, I think every religious person, every spiritual seeker should do. Make, don't just follow. So anyway, that I was invited to go to his school to teach there, you know, last year as how to pass exams. And I got this wonderful letter back from the principal of that school saying thank you for coming because that year the Jewish school in Western Australia got the top honours, all their students passed much better than any other school. It actually works. So this is learning just how to not worry if you're going to be doing a very important exam or interview or anything else. Don't look at the future like two bad bricks. Look at all the good things which can happen. And more than that, that there was uh, the time when we, we Worry and anxiety, this was uh, a disciple. She was studying um, dentistry, not dentistry, yeah, dentistry in Adelaide University. And she had such severe panic attacks that she got bedridden. And she was being looked after just by her boyfriend, uh, Lloyd. Her name was Jip Jippy. She was a Thai. Unfortunately for her, her father was a close disciple of mine, come to the monastery every time when there's any difficulties or problems or just to feed the monks. So she rang him and he asked me to help. So I called her. I was living in Perth. Adelaide is about 2,000 kilometres away. And I asked her, when you have an anxiety attack, where do you feel it in your body? Straight away, you realize that any emotional difficulty has a counterpart feeling in your body. Where do you feel it? And she said, well, in my chest. So that's not good enough. I want coordinates. You know, you're studying science. <laughs> From your navel, your belly button, centimeters and millimeters up. And where does it finish? Is it even all around? Does it extend to your left or to your right? I want a detailed description of when you have an anxiety attack, where you feel it. What you were doing, you were giving her some responsibility over her sickness. Instead of telling her what to do, she was actually taking some authority over her cure. Three days later, she gave me a call back with a beautiful description of the area where she can feel the tension or tightness when she had a panic attack and exactly just how it developed and how it shrunk. I said, well done. Now what does it feel like? She was like tense and tight. And my reply was not good enough. I want a detailed description. Is it hot? How tight is it? Give me some, some similes. Give me a call back in three days. So she gave me another call back. I'm not just to try to have some peace and quiet for myself. I wanted her 
to really see you know, her panic attacks and how it manifested on her body. Basically, as you all know, how to be mindful. Not just ordinary mindful, but really mindful. And after three days, she gave this incredibly long description. She had nothing else to do, she was bedridden. Of when she had a panic attack, how it felt in her chest area. So well done, I was really impressed. Now I said, next time you have one of these panic attacks, you know where it is in your chest, take your hand and massage it. Massage it just with lots and lots of kindness and gentleness, as much as you can possibly do. And if you can't do that, you've got your boyfriend Lloyd looking after you, get him to do that. I'm sure he won't complain. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a call back in three days. And in three days, nine day treatment, and at the end of the third day, she called and, and I asked her, what happened when you gave it a massage? She said, oh, when I massaged it, or my boyfriend massaged it, the tightness went away. What happened to the anxiety? And these are moments I'll always remember. The, the Eureka moment. She was totally quiet for a second or two. And then she said, and the anxiety disappeared as well. So well done. Now you know how to deal with your panic attacks. It worked. A couple of weeks later, she was out of bed, back to studies. And she was so impressed that she did nominate me for Australian of the Year. I didn't get it, <laughs> thank goodness. But more than that, later on, when Lloyd proposed to her and they got married, they insisted on coming to Perth for the marriage because they wanted me to do the blessing for them. GP and Lloyd. They've got three kids now. Very nice to be of service to them. Simple things. How to deal with anxiety. Anxiety does have a physical counterpart in your body. For you it may not be in your chest, it may be somewhere else. Any other stress which you have. Grief. Try to deal with it in your mind. It's sometimes too difficult. You can find out where it manifests in your body. It's much easier to deal with. And if you deal with it with kindness, which is what the massage is all about, massage it really kindly. Then you find you've got a really good chance of the cause also being softened until the anxiety itself disappears. That was the end of our panic attacks. You know, I've taught that many times to doctors. I remember this one doctor in Perth. She said she had one of her uh, patients in the hospital it was on oxygen because that's how anxious she was about life. And then, uh, according to how she was trained, she had to prescribe this medication. When that didn't work, the next medication and then another medication to go through all the list of medications to try and overcome her anxiety. When she got to the last medication and that didn't work, just out of, at the end of the day, she was really sort of tired and she shouldn't have done this, but she, described, she prescribed Ajahn Brahm medication. <laughs> In other words, when you have a panic attack, where do you feel it? Take your hand and massage it. I always remember this because she came and told me it worked. The next morning when she went to hospital, her patient was off the oxygen and said, I feel fine now, I'm going home. And she did. I got no credit for that. I'm glad I got no credit for it because she was probably put in jail for not doing a, a procedure which was uh, authorised. Strange that, isn't it? Why do we have to have authorization when things actually do work? But nevertheless, so if you have any anxiety, that's a wonderful way of overcoming it. And any fear, what are you afraid of? You know, sometimes people stay awake at night thinking of all the things which might go wrong in the world. Have you ever done that? How about staying awake at night and thinking of all the things which might go right in the world? It's much more likely to happen because there's so many good people in this world. 
kind people. When you find there's so many, yeah, there's bad people in this world, stupid people in this world, I would say. But the majority of people are kind and good. They just need to be encouraged some more. And when you uh, think of the future, don't just think of what might go wrong. Think of what might go right. Especially for you. In your life, what are you afraid of most of all? Death. Death. Getting, old. getting old. Look, I'm not afraid of getting old, you know why? Because <laughs> I'm already old. <laughs> it's not that bad. A different stage of your life. But death. Who needs to be afraid of death? Okay, I'm going to say this one. Okay, it's a bad joke, but here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> many, because I travel around a lot giving talks all over the place, many times people said, Ajahn Brahm, you shouldn't go flying in aircraft so much. It's dangerous. Especially, you know, the route from Australia to places like UK. You travel over the Middle East. And I remember this one plane was shot down by the Russian rebels, or sorry, somebody over Ukraine or somewhere, or Georgia. It's very dangerous flying an aircraft. And sometimes people do wear suicide belts and blow up the planes. So, I said, you shouldn't travel around in aircraft so much. And then I said, no. There are three benefits, advantages, from dying in an aircraft explosion at 30,000 feet. I worked this out, I didn't borrow it from anybody, just so that people would allow me to fly. What are the three benefits of dying in an aircraft explosion at 30,000 feet? Number one, instant cremation. <laughs> no cost to your family. Have you ever tried to arrange a funeral for an old grandfather or father? It's really difficult. You have to wait, it takes time and so much money. And then what do you do with the ashes? If you die at 30,000 feet, your ashes are spread. Just like, you know, your grandma might want. You we'll spread your ashes and it's all cremated all in the same time. It's very efficient. Advantage number two. If you die in air, or if you ordinarily die, how much does funerals cost in UK now? Quite a few thousand pounds, isn't it? Yeah. At 30,000 feet, your family don't have to pay anything. You get insurance payout. <laughs> the family make money out of Granny's death. <laughs> and <laughs> the third advantage, the best of all, if you die in an aircraft explosion at 30,000 feet, you are so close to heaven, it's easy to go the rest of the way. You're halfway there. <laughs> you may not agree with that, but it's still good fun. <laughs> so, so little things like that to take away the fear of dying and death. A lot of times people say, how can you let go of the fear of death? To have lived a wonderful life. If you've lived a good life, you find you're not afraid of death. Either you disappear totally, but if you're a Buddhist, you know that you get reborn. And if you lived a really good life, and look at me, I'm really old now. You're not that old as you like. No. No. Old enough to die? No. No, oh dear. <laughs> But you know, some people are really older than I am. Yeah, really yes. old, really old, really old, really old. And if they die, imagine what it's like. I don't know how you came here. Did you come here today in a car or in a bicycle? Imagine having this really old car, which is really hard to maintain. And it's very difficult even to find parking for. If you have like an old car, wouldn't you like to trade it in for, a, say, a Ferrari? No? Okay, I'm going to tell this story whether you like it or not. 
Am I over time? No? Okay. Ten minutes. Okay. Once upon a time, there were these two people. They were husband and wife. We married for so many years. They loved each other so much. And they were really good people. So when one of them died, the other one died a couple of days later. I've seen that many times. They're so close together that when one goes, they can't really stand being alone. So the other one dies as well. So they appeared in this heaven realm. And they appeared in this heaven realm and this kind of Buddhist angel came up to them and said, you've been both really, really good, kind people. I've come to show you your heavenly reward. They took them to this huge mansion on the cliffs. Much bigger than the place we're looking for for our next Anukampa monastery. This was on the cliffs. Beautiful views. And the angel said, this is your heavenly reward for all the kindness and goodness you've done over your many years together. Please enjoy. And the man, who was always so practical, over practical, said, it's a very nice mansion, but someone on my salary can't afford the council rates. The land tax, what, is it? what do you call it? Council tax. Council tax. A big mansion costs a lot of money just to go to the council. And the angel said, sir, we don't have any councils up in here. This is free. <laughs> Enjoy. <coughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful to stay in a place you don't have any councils telling you what to do or giving you bills every week or month or whatever? So it's all for free. So he took him inside this mansion. My goodness. It wasn't just big. Just all the furnishings there were just really impressive. Yeah, they had chandeliers. But this was not with Waterford crystal. This was with diamonds, <laughs> huge diamonds. They had this incredibly big uh, TV. What do they call it? Crystal set TVs? No. LTV? I don't know that. <laughs> LED, big LED TV. <laughs> and he said, I know you always liked watching soccer when you were young. Now on this big soccer screen, on this big TV screen, you can turn it on. England always wins <laughs> at the last minute. <laughs> this is heaven. <laughs> you know, guys, in the UK. And it took him inside the toilet. The toilet was amazing. Obviously solid gold. And the little button you have to press on the top was a ruby. Priceless. And when you pressed it, water never came out. Chanel number five. <laughs> <laughs> it was heaven. And then the guy said, look, you know, someone on my salary, this is really expensive stuff. We'll need insurance. I won't be able to afford the insurance premiums. And straight away, the heavenly beings said, sir, you don't need insurance in heaven. Up in heaven, we don't allow thieves. There's no burglars allowed. You don't need insurance. Anything you want changed, just give me a call. We'll change it straight away for you. So then they took him down to the garage. Triple garage. Not double, triple. To the first garage, there was this stretch limo. I mean, a real stretch limo, not one of these small ones you see these film stars are being driven in. So big, they had a swimming pool in the back. <laughs> the next car, <laughs> next car was one of these uh, go anywhere four wheel drives. It was so powerful, they said it could even go up waterfalls. <laughs> not cross rivers, but right up. That's how powerful it was. <laughs> And the third car was a red limited edition Lamborghini. One of the fastest cars in the world. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I was told it was very fast. And, he, and we all knew how much you loved fast cars. Now you can have one because now you're in heaven. And he said, look, What's the point of having a fast car these days? 
Number one, too much traffic, too many jabs. Number two, too many police and speed cameras. And the angel said, sir, there's no traffic jams in heaven. There's no police or speed cameras here. You can go as fast as you like. And it doesn't matter if you have an accident, you're already dead. <laughs> Enjoy. And then they opened up the <laughs> door. They opened up the door. <laughs> Don't encourage me. I'm not. <laughs> they opened up the doors of the garage. And on the opposite side of the garage was an incredibly immaculate 18 hole golf course. And the angel said, we knew how much you enjoyed golf. But in the last few years, you were too sick to play. This is a golf course especially for you. And it was designed, designed by Tiger Woods. <laughs> now, don't say Tiger Woods is still alive. Do you remember when he had the argument with his wife, he had a crash? He had an out-of-the-body experience. And when he was temporarily dead, they took him out to heaven to design that golf course. <laughs> so, in the, in the golf course, as long as you get the ball on the green, whichever way you putt it, it always goes in. It's, it's heaven. And he said straight away, look, it's a nice golf course. But someone like me, you've got to be elected, you've got to be some rich person or politician or some crook to get elected to a golf course like that. And the angel said, sir, you're already elected. You're a member, not a life member, a death member. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy. And as, <laughs> as soon as they said that, the angel left. And as soon as the angel left, the man got very angry at his wife really angry and she couldn't understand why are you getting angry from, at me you've got this beautiful mansion you can watch your football match and you know they're going to win in the end you can go in your Lamborghini car as fast as you want police will never find you, there's no police up here if you crash you're dead anyway so what, what's the matter and you've got your golf course on the other side of the road why are you angry at me and he looked at his wife like fire in his eyes. And he said, wife, wife. If, if it wasn't for all that health food you gave me in the last few years, I could have been up here years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so why are you always eating vegan food and low fat food and vegetarian food and stuff like that? Now you know why I like, uh, Sausages. <laughs> I've got this great heavenly mansion waiting for you. Yeah, I'm out of this world, yeah. That's the thing with monks and nuns. The pay is terrible. <laughs> but the retirement benefits, out of this world. <laughs> oh, I think I've gone on for too long, haven't I, as usual? Yeah, right. We can do some Q&A. Okay, Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> Anxiety and fear. You're going to die anyway, so why not get it over with? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, got a question. Yes, sorry. Yeah. Go on. I have a question about the, what you said uh, uh -oh. earlier about uh, what about if it goes right rather than wrong. <laughs> but then uh, when we think about when, what if it goes wrong, isn't that like a, uh, like a kind of a preparation uh, response, sort of looking out for danger and then trying to think of how we will handle it. And if we, if we just think about what happens if it goes right, uh, couldn't that just be wishful, wishful thinking? A lot of times the wishful thinking is, what happens if it goes wrong? Because a lot of time that negativity almost causes it to go wrong. But this is not too much to do with the talk, but it kind of um, comes in now. After being a theoretical physicist, I became a school teacher for one year. And you had to learn some educational psychology. And this was one of the, uh, one of the experiments which really shook me. Two classes of children in UK, in a high school, maybe 12-year-old, 13-year-old, 
two classes. At the end of the year, they gave the end of year exam for them and they graded them into two classes, class A and class B. Only what the two psychologists and the principal never told anybody was that the child who came top went in class A, the child children who came second and third went in class B, fourth and fifth went in class A, sixth and seventh went in class B, eighth and ninth went in class A. They split them up as evenly as possible. And they never told the teachers, you're teaching class A next year, you're teaching class B. And even the children never knew, the <coughs> parents never knew what was going on. Because half the kids were told they were in class A, they thought they were class A children. They became class A children after one year. They did so much better the next, the next year than the class B children, who were exactly the same. If you think you're a class A kid, you become a class A kid. If you think you're class B, you do become class B. That psychology is very powerful. If you think things go wrong, they do go wrong. If you think they go right, they can go right. <coughs> and even if there are some difficulties in whichever path you take, sometimes you would think it can be done. It's amazing just how you can find these, these different ways of doing things. You make it right. It's when some people ask me the question, how do you make choices in life? Really important choices. <coughs> how you make important choices? The choice itself is not, imp not really important. Go left or go right. That doesn't really matter as much as what do you do once you've turned left? What do you do once you've turned right? Whichever decision you make, save most of your energy into making that decision right. People forget about that. They worry, they're concerned. What's the right decision? They try and get advice. It doesn't really matter. What really matters is what you do after you made the decision. Make it work. And it's amazing just how you can make almost any choice work. It's what you do afterwards is most important. So you don't have to have any fear. So people start slowly with the Q&A and then towards the end, like 10 people put their hands up. So we've got to get it over with also. Yeah. Otherwise... Yeah, okay. Next question. Okay, no question. People putting their hand up. No, no. <laughs> Story. This is for the Buddha. A man came to ask the Buddha, why is it when well, some people are really wealthy in life, other people are very poor? And he, he gave a good explanation, it's karma you do in your previous life, why you easily make money in this life, and why sometimes, no matter how hard you work, you just can't make ends meet. Then he said afterwards, it's such a good answer, he asked the second question, why are some people beautiful in this life, while other people are ugly? Now first of all, I will make the point that when I said the word beautiful, I was looking at the floor, not at you. Because I, I mentioned the word ugly when I was in Singapore and I just happened to be looking at one woman, <laughs> just by chance. My goodness, she really complained. <laughs> Why did you say the word ugly when you were looking at me, Ajahn Brah? <laughs> just by, that's why I train myself always looking at the floor. Even say the word beautiful, I've got to be very careful too because people think, well, I'm a monk, I'm single, but I'm not available. <laughs> So he gave another good answer. But then the main question, why are some people intelligent while other people are stupid? You may send your daughter or your son to like counsel, not counselling, uh, extra studies by a tutor, and they still <coughs> can't pass their exams. While other people, they mess around all the time and they still get A's and go to university and go to Cambridge or Oxford or somewhere, and it's just so easy for them. Why are some people intelligent while other people are stupid? If you want to be intelligent in your next life, the Buddha said the cause for intelligence in your next life is asking questions in this life. <laughs> Any questions? 
You got a chance. Don't think you did have a chance. Oh, yes. Oh, two, yes, good. Guy first and then. Okay, go first. Maybe not a question, but a comment. Okay. Um, sometimes we can be very afraid of situations, situations yeah. that we don't want to be in sometime yeah. in the future. And then it happens. Yeah, oh, yeah. So we find ourselves in a situation we didn't want. But then we can also realize this is actually quite cool. Yeah. And find benefits. Yeah. Positive aspects of the situation that we really didn't want. Indeed. What that, what that means is your level of fear disappears because you find there's nothing to be afraid of. Things you don't like, but you learn so much from them. Difficulties, and you know the old stories about treading in the dog poo. <laughs> Who likes to tread in dog poo? If you tread in dog poo, it's fertilizer for your garden, for free. So always take it home with you. Keep your shoes on in the car as you're driving home with all the dog poo on. And you only <laughs> scrape it off when you get home under your apple tree or something. Your apples are just so juicy afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Someone doesn't believe you, they say no, no, no. You try it. Have you tried it yet? Look. You know, sometimes all the beliefs which people have. I get myself into really silly situations. Once I was uh, invited by one of the teachers to give a talk in a primary school in Perth. And I thought, well, that's not so bad, I can do that. But it was grade one and grade twos. How can you teach Dhamma to people who are five years of age and six years of age? Even getting them to... Getting them to uh, pay attention to you is difficult. So I decided to teach them about where all your preferences come from. I asked them, please put your hand up if you don't like eating rice pudding. And about three kids, there's about 60 kids there, two, two years, about three or four kids put their hand up, they didn't like eating rice pudding. And all the other kids were looking around, and then two more kids put their hand up. They didn't like eating rice pudding either. And then a few more kids put their hand up. Within about one minute, I had all the 60 kids putting their hands up. They agreed they did not like eating rice pudding. Great, put your hands down. Now, please put your hand up if you've ever eaten rice pudding. <laughs> and about five kids put their hand up, and everyone else laughed including all the parents who were there and the teachers. That's how you teach Dhamma. A simple question which shows why we accept some things and why we reject others. We haven't even tried it yet. So you know some of the food which I've eaten as a young monk in Thailand was sticky rice and frog. A frog about this size on the top of your rice. Can you eat that? Why do you say no? Have you ever had any frog on rice? How do you know what it tastes like? Oh yeah, you have. <laughs> this was just boiled frog. No garlic, no salt, no fish sauce. Just boiled frog. One of the monks sitting next to me, tell this to your, your kids never paid any attention in biology class. And they said, what, what's the use of biology class? This is the use. I paid attention, so I knew one part of a frog from another. This guy next to me didn't know anything about frog biology. So when he was picking out the insides, he pressed the frog's bladder. Yes, you're right, he had your right in. And that frog peed all over his rice. <laughs> he stopped his meal then, even though he was hungry. It's only one meal a day we had. So that some. So, I'm oh, Matty. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> it's related to the rice pudding question. The rice pudding question. Yes, very deep. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious because I feel like a, on a social level, a lot of that fear is coming from our community, people around us. Yes. How, 
What's a skillful way to address that kind of community level of, of fear? Community level of fear. What's people really afraid of? <laughs> the one thing over in Western Australia is bushfires. We had a, a bushfire close to our monastery just on Arcatina Day, the biggest celebration of the year. And the bushfire brigade tried to close our road, stop everybody going there. And I just had to really sweet talk to the head of the bushfire brigade. Look, it's a long distance away. And this is really an important ceremony for us. Just an overreaction. It's like what you call like corning wolf. The fire never came to us, never came close to us. So that was one of the reasons why, if you create fear in a community, sometimes people have no trust in the people who are caring for our community, who are in charge of our community. The fear gets too much and it's unjustified. You have big storms. You've got to pay extra care. But you know, sometimes people close roads and... Well, it's like the COVID time, when you weren't even able to see your mum in the old people's home. And that's gross. If you ask a mother and ask a visitor, this may spread a bit more COVID, are you willing to do that? Most people would say yes. So instead of having like a mummy or daddy government telling you what to do, you make your choice. Make sure it's well informed. Usually things go much better. Don't just believe. That's just controlled by fear. And of course, I think you all know, those who get involved in politics, fear is the tool which most governments use to control others. I think that's pretty okay, isn't it? True? Imagine people didn't have fear. Yeah, some people die, but as a Buddhist, you always get reborn again. It's no big deal. Like, you know, if you do an exam, yeah, some people will fail. But an exam, you can always do it again, can't you? You fail your driving test, you can do it again. Surely life should be like that as well. You make a choice, it doesn't work, you die. Come back again, have a second go. Makes much more sense to me. Do you agree with that? You can say no. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I very much agree. Yeah. Okay. It changes the way people relate to difficulties <laughs> and problems in life. Well, maybe it was because you know, my family over in London, they grew up in the second, well, actually, I just grew up just after the Second World War. They were right in the middle of it, getting bombed. Even mother and grandmother living in a terraced house, and the house next door got a direct hit. Everyone inside their house was killed instantly. And this was just you know, a small brick wall between that house and where my mother and uh, grandmother were staying. She was a small girl at the time. Apparently her arm got lacerated by the broken glass. She didn't remember anything of it. But that was actually par for the course. And everyone would have that danger. That didn't stop them living and caring for one another and cracking jokes and having a wonderful time. I know my parents used to say that was a, one of the most harmonious times you know, living in London during the Blitz. Everyone was looking after one another. Strange. They were so close to death, maybe that life was more important than we have today. And they weren't even afraid, you know, because they said if that bomb has got your name on it or number on it, you're going to die anyway, so I'd be afraid. And people were like that. <coughs> Impressive. Impressive. Your next one? Oh, yeah. Thank you for the teachers as always. Um, when you're talking about the, it's just the simplicity of changing perspective, changing perception of yeah. the situation, um, and that fear and that worry and that anxiety disappearing. Um, but I think my whole life has been driven by 
fear and worry and feelings of not good enough and that anxiety oh, wow. drives that anxiety and anxiety is almost the symptom of what my thought processes are um, and I was sat here surrounded by spiritual friends and yourselves yeah. um, and listening to the teachings it's why, why can't I do this when I'm outside in, in the normal world yeah. um, and I think about the path and the path work and um, the journey that we want to go on and it feels so um, the fibres are being torn apart in where I want to go, the direction I want to go, um, but my conditioning from the past is just like a bungee cord, just bring me back again. Yeah. Um, and how to, I suppose, what, what's my question? Um, <laughs> how, how to do the simplicity, yeah. the, the simple side. That's one thing which really uh, confuses many Buddhist teachers in the East. Why is it that people in the West feel they're not good enough? And one of the reasons is because our fault finding mind. We spend a lot of time, we do re receive blame. Get that from your parents. You're never good enough. It's one of the things which I saw as a student. Yeah. Your O levels are coming up. Stop chasing a football. I loved football when I was young. Stay at home, do your homework, and then you get good O levels and you'll be happy in life. I just believe them. So I did well. What happens when you pass your O levels? You get A levels. And that time I wasn't chasing a ball anymore. I was chasing girls. I was a young man growing up. And so stop going out at night to parties. Stay home, do your homework. If you pass your A-levels, then you'll be happy in life. So I passed the A-levels. Was I happy? No. Then I had to do exams for Cambridge, scholarship exams. So I passed those. Was I happy? No. Still had to do work for the degrees. And that's when I started to get suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> I saw all these people who got degrees, really good degrees. Were they happy? No, they weren't. Even in Emmanuel College, you hang out with some, some doctors and PhDs and uh, even sort of Nobel laureates. They weren't happy at all. And so I started doubting. What do you mean not good enough? Do something to make it better. And that is always feeling you're never good enough, no matter who you are. You are all good enough. I will now prove it to you. This story, giving a talk in the Mental Health Week over in Australia to some clients of the Mental Health Service. And after I gave this talk, these two women came out and said they wanted to apologise to me. And I said, why? Well, actually, we, we, we saw you coming in and we didn't know who you are. You're not a professor or you're not in the industry. And we thought, who is this, please excuse me, who is this wanker coming to talk to us? <laughs> That's what they called me. <laughs> and then I said, but you made us laugh and cry. Thank you, we're sorry we even thought that of you. It was a brilliant speech. And one thing which I said to them there, I'm a forest monk. I've lived in the forest ever since I ordained as a monk. And in the forest, whether it's in Thailand or in um, Sri Lanka or in any part of the world like Australia or Boar's Hill, yeah, I haven't lived there long enough yet. In a forest, I've never yet in my whole life seen a perfect tree. One which is really straight with all the branches in the right place, all the leaves green and no damage on the bark. Every tree is imperfect. So I told the people who were the clients of mental health, give all these names, ADHD, Spectrum Disorder, or whatever else, I forget all the, the names, I don't really take them too seriously these days. All the people who are not perfect, you belong. You belong in this wonderful forest called humanity. Welcome. That made them cry. Because one thing about being different, thinking there's something wrong with you, you feel rejected by others, not love, not a place where you can be 
uh, welcomed. And then to make it even more powerful, all you people are really damaged. And you've had some very traumatic experiences in your life, damaged by others, damaged by your upbringing or whatever. You are the most twisted and crooked trees in the forest. Lots of damage on your bark. You are my favorite ones. Honestly, when I go to a forest, I know the forest where I live. The trees which are the most twisted and bent and damaged, they're my favorite ones. If I need to have a photograph taken of me, those are the trees I choose to have a photograph with. The most damaged and twisted. They're the most beautiful. That is why you don't have to be perfect. Don't ever think you're not good enough. You're already so perfect. You're a tree in the forest. Now even like the Germans, they love their forests. I never yet seen one German national who likes to go into the black forest and straighten every tree. <laughs> it's a ridiculous idea. I've seen many people who want to straighten every human being. You're not good enough. Please, if you have any confidence with teachers like Aya Chadda and myself, please believe it. You are more than good enough. And that's really important even for meditation. I know so many people, they get close to the deep meditations and they think, no, I can't do this, I'm not good enough, I don't deserve it. My goodness. I always feel like I should recondition you by getting you all to say, I am good enough, okay? I am good enough. I am good enough. I am good enough. Good enough. Yay! <laughs> At least I can condition you. And if you've got kids, that's obviously where we first hear it from. Mum and Dad really love you. They want you to do well in life, but please, if you've got kids, tell your kids they're more than good enough. That's one of the things which my father told me, son, the door of my house will always be open to you no matter what you ever do. That was so important. Have you said that to your children yet? If you have, well done. Tell your children, whatever you do, however you turn out, I'm your dad, I'm your mum. You don't have to be perfect for me. The door of my heart will always be open. It's unconditional acceptance and love. You do that to yourself as well. Even all the bad jokes I've said in my life. <laughs> I don't know how you put up with me. I'm going over time all the time. I don't know how you put up with me. Okay. That's how you feel good enough. But thank you for that question because that's such an important question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> not really related to this uh, topic at all, but more of a clarification on, I guess, some understanding of Buddhism. Of, so my understanding is there's a belief that when a being uh, dies and is reborn, if they've made good karma, they kind of go up into a higher kind of realm and humans seem to be up at the top. Is that, would that, would that be accurate or inaccurate to say that there's a hierarchy between species? Not really a hierarchy, but it's what you want to be reborn as. One of my friends, disciples if you like to say it, over in Australia, said when they die, they want to be reborn as a dog. Okay. <laughs> and I said, why? He said, well think about it, Ajahn Brahm. A dog doesn't need to go to school, <laughs> doesn't do homework, does need to get a job. They get fed really delicious food. You know you give them human food a lot of the time. <laughs> and they don't need to do any work. They just curl up in a the corner. They're taken for a walk in the morning and the afternoon maybe, if they're lucky. Imagine the life of a dog. No worries, no stress at all. And that's it. So I, want, I don't want to be reborn as a, a man or a woman anymore. I want to be reborn as a dog. And then I told him, but you know in Australia, probably the same in England, 
if your a young dog has been born, you had to be taken to the vet to be de-sexed. <laughs> Same in it, you okay? As soon as I said that, he said, mm, I think I changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I got him out of that one. What would you like to be reborn as? A cat. <laughs> That's even worse. <laughs> they get these sexed as well, you know, over in Perth. <laughs> but anyhow, when you ask that question, what would you like to be reborn as? And for a lot of people, it's they choose their life when they can learn the most. Still things which you haven't really learned, whether it's compassion, whether it's generosity, kindness. So we often go to a rebirth where we feel we can get the most improvement in our existence, life. Maybe in the next life, become a, a nun. That's one of the reasons why we're building uh, this new not building, but buying this new uh, Anukampa Bhikkhuni uh, place up in Boar's Hill, next to, Ox eh, next to here. We found this beautiful place, and it's on sale. We want to buy it, I want to buy it. And the trouble is, being a monk, all these wants, I don't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I rely on you. So, is it on, it's on, not on the website yet, is it? Whose website? Your website. Oh, because we're, we're not um, buyers yet, Ajahn. We're not buyers yet. Oh. <laughs> well, we will be. It's up to you. If you want to see a beautiful bhikkhuni monastery, isn't it? It's obvious. We have monks' monasteries all over the place. Bhikkhuni monastery. How many bhikkhunis, fully ordained Buddhist nuns, are there in England right now? Where is no she? One, knows, <laughs> one, that's all, and she's right here. She's a rare species. <laughs> On the brink of extinction. Brink of it, well, we just re revived you. Yeah. Just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Endangered species, but it makes so much sense to have female monastics given an equal chance. Look, there's something I haven't said yet, but people tell me this and I agree with them. Even though I'm very well known as a teacher, there's some things which I can't teach. Which only a female, because you know, she's been there and done it, can teach. This is one of the reasons why it's really important to have female teachers. Not just one, but to maybe amplify this to many, many. I'm not saying everybody has to ordain, but if you really want to. Is there for you. Another little story for you, this is true. When I first started at Bikuni Monastery in Perth, Western Australia, first thing I did was just put an, a, a, an announcement in our newsletter, we're starting a Bikuni Monastery. And everybody was totally for it, even the Thai people in our centre. Yes, we support it. And the trouble was you needed money for it. So you were trying to get $1,000 here, $100 there. And then one day this guy came up, uh, see me, he made an appointment, and he said, this is all absolute literal, he said, my wife has just given birth to my first child. She's a girl. I want, I hear you're building a monastery for women. He said, I want my daughter to have the opportunity, if she wants, to be a nun. So here's my donation, $250,000. I don't usually shake. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm shaking. It's a huge donation. That really got it off the ground, ready to look for a place suitable place. If any of you have been to Perth, where I live, our nuns monastery is called Dhammasara. Quite tiny, 583 acres. <laughs> Beautiful land. So it can be a real forest monastery. 583. 
if I could, I'd bring, say, 83 acres over. But I don't know how I can fit it in my baggage. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that's, what, that's what I really want to do, and I need your help for that. So please, if you know anybody who really feels that equity is important in the UK, it's one way of helping. I'm passionate about this. That's why I come here. You know, I've got plenty of other things to do in my life. <laughs> Honestly. But anyway, this is important to me. And you've got a beautiful nun. How long have you been a bhikkhuni now? Well, I've been in for 18 years. I'm fully ordained at yeah. 10. Yeah. It's a long time. And I'm sure you've heard her teachings many times. It's a nice thing for you to contribute to in your life. A real Buddhist monastery for women. Should have been done years ago. But never mind, we're doing it now. Any other questions? So anyone who's got a check for 250,000, please come yeah. on. <laughs> 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 Over there, John. Yes. Yes. Um, why, um, you know why different, like, different people face anxiety and fear to a different level? So some people in their lives will be immobilised by it and other people, people won't impact them as much and the same with other things like suffering. Yes. You said that some people have extreme anxiety and fear. They're immobilised, they can't go anywhere. You know, one of the therapies which is powerful and is uh, important for you to know is that association with confident people, with kind, loving people, takes people out of the deep senses of fear. In the story behind this was that, well, I'll tell the whole story, there was a king's elephant many hundreds of years ago, and an elephant was a main way, a way of transport through the jungles. It was safest, and the elephant knew its way, no one would attack it. And so the elephant, a good elephant, was like a prized possession of a king. So they had one of these amazing elephants, but then one day he started to get a bit grumpy. You know, he would poo right when the trainer was behind him. And sometimes he would pass wind. When I was in Sri Lanka, and sometimes people would put me on these processions. And because I was a monk and well-known, I was right in the front, just right behind the elephants. <laughs> that was the most scariest time. <laughs> Not because I was afraid the elephant would actually swipe me with its trunk. But if the elephant passed wind, you know how big an elephant is? <laughs> If it had passed the wind, I'd have fainted. <laughs> but anyway, the king's elephant was always very well behaved, but now it turned around and was naughty. And so the king wondered, it must be some disease it had. Tried to get all the doctors and whatever to try and find out what was wrong with the elephant. They couldn't find anything wrong with it. But then, one of the wise ministers, a typical Buddhist story, one of the wise ministers said, look, I'll check out, I'll stay with the elephant overnight and see what happens. So he stayed with the elephant all night and heard early in the morning, and when everyone was asleep, heard his people congregating behind the elephant store. Went to check and there was these bandits, these bad people. They were planning who they're going to steal from, dealing in drugs, alcohol. And simply because this elephant was associating or hearing bad people every evening, that's what turned the elephant into a bad character who you meet with, who influences you. So the minister told the king, the king arrested all those uh, bad people and asked the monks and nuns to go there every evening just to discuss Dharma, to meditate, to chant. Just because they were kind people, the elephant changed back again, became even a better elephant than he was before. And that's like the words of association with fools or bad people turns you into a bad person. Associating with the wise turns you into a good people. That's one of the reasons why we have visitors to places like the monastery where I live. 
one person I'm going to mention, he was uh, started getting into drugs, heroin, in Singapore. You know that's a death sentence. His father was very smart and sent him to Bodhinyana Monastery about three months, well, a couple of months, associating with us. That allowed him to cut his ties with the supplies of heroin, get off his habit, and when he went back to Singapore, he was fine. I've always kept in contact with him ever since. He's got a nice wife, a couple of kids, doing well in his business. And he always says, thank you. Just associating with good people sometimes stops some of those bad tendencies. So one of the therapies, if you are totally afraid of everybody and people, to go to a place where there's kind people, good people. And after a while, you don't feel afraid in a place like Bodhidhyana Monastery or Anukampa, uh, Vihara. There's nothing to be afraid of. There's kind, good people there. And after a while, that anxiety gets less and less and less and less. Yeah? Um, the other kind of things I've had in the past, all of the kind of things I've had, have gone through lots of hardship. Um, and they are kind because they are going through hardship. How does it track the associated with bad people leads to bad pathologies, anxiety and depression? Because a lot of time bad people are often very critical, not loving. You talk about the current people. What people did? You said um, often the kindest people are the ones who've been through the most suffering. Oh yes. So in that case, it might not be the case that associating with bad people leads to bad results. Now, a lot of the, they're very kind, but they often associate just with other people who take advantage of them. They're very cruel to them. How's the time going? Can I tell her? Um, yeah, like okay. five minutes max. Okay. This is when people have had lots of fear and trauma in their life. I half told a story earlier in another venue. I never actually finished it. And this was how powerful some of these stories are. They've been ex extended by very, very wonderful people. And they come and tell me the results. This is the story of opening the door of your heart, which many people feel, yeah, yeah, I understand that, unconditional love, wonderful thing to do, but how powerful is it? And this is the group over in Perth called Assets, Australian Society of Survivors of Torture and Trauma. This takes refugees who come into a country like Australia, who have been in these underground torture chambers, multiple rapes, beatings and goodness knows what else they've had to endure. They have freedom when they land in a country like Australia physically, but the memories of what they endured and somehow survived still remain with them. They're not free yet. So this group of psychologists, they told me they got permission to actually to, to do this because of their university degrees, but all the important details they learned from me. And the important details are, you have a person who's been tortured. You don't want to hear the details of it because it's absolutely gross. And it's how people survive. Just, it's hard to actually to think. But anyway, they're asked, in brief, to actually to feel safe in a place, just in this little uh, room, and then they are asked to sit down quietly, close their eyes, and they have to feel safe, it's most important. And then they imagine, in their heart area, they've got these two doors, just like the doors coming in here, that's a single door or whatever, a double door. Imagine that double door opening up, and the part of them they can live with, and the kind part of them, the part which wasn't abused, or tortured, or beaten, that's inside of them. They look out onto the floor, try and make it sort of very uh, coarse on the outside, like concrete, wet. They see those little girls, who are them, who were tortured, were raped, 
beaten, abused, standing outside alone in the cold. And then they imagine like these old aircraft, the stairs coming back down from their heart, down to the ground. And then they, on top there, inside, they invite them in. Come on in. I will never try and get rid of you, demean you ever again. And one by one, these little boys who are raped, beaten, starved, walk up, walk up the steps. And you embrace them on the top of the steps, come inside. The door of my heart is open to you. You're never trying to get rid of them. You're trying to learn how to love them and be kind to them. It takes a incredible amount of courage to be able to do that. The results are really awesome. You know, seeing that and seeing one of these women. I like telling this story because she was telling what happened to her in some underground military dungeon somewhere in the world to the, one of our, our members. And he was saying, that was terrible what happened to you. And she, she scolded him. It's not terrible. This has made me who I am. And he really backed off. It was an amazing thing she was saying. She was one of these incredible, strong, almost like superheroes. She'd embraced it. And in her life, she could amaze him just how powerful she will be to help others. That's the kind of thing which we can do. Nothing is ever without meaning. And to find that meaning is sometimes really tough. You need help, support, and a good map of how to get out of those traumas of life. When I heard that, I was just, please excuse me, I always get emotional when I say that because this is really tough dukkha in this world which people you deal with in a really amazing Buddhist way. And they become into society and they have a life again. So, is the end of calling what is bad good? Yes, not calling it good, bad, what was good. Bad has gone. And they make use of that to make more good in this world. They never call it good. They make use of it to make something beautiful. Does that make sense? Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I was just trying to see how it relates to the first question I followed up. What was that, yeah? Um, go on. Go on. Um, why some people endure more suffering than others? What, uh, why they, ha they endure more than others? You may call it some kind of karma if you wish, but I don't like calling it karma as you wish. Sometimes you just don't know. But instead of, this is an old story of the Buddha when he gets shot by an arrow, he said you don't go looking at who shot the arrow and why they shot it. You've been shot. Heal it. Get a doctor. Don't waste time. That's what these, these women were doing. Not wasting time. Why did this happen to me? It has happened. Now heal it. Later on you can try and figure out why. We don't use that thing, oh I did bad karma in the past, I deserve this. That's just more blame. That doesn't help at all. You don't know why. You don't have to know why. Learn from it, grow from it. And other people in the same situation, you can be a help to them. That's enough. Do you want to say something? I'm just thinking to, I'm thinking to wrap up because uh, the time is coming to a close, but to lead into what we're actually doing here, which is to create that beautiful spiritual community whereby you can have contact with good people, not only the monastics, but one another. Because I think that really is what makes the difference in our lives. The Buddha said that the whole of the spiritual life is good friendship, wise friendship, with people who are on the right path and who can encourage and inspire and just be a friend to those who want to walk that path with them. 
So I think this is the main difference, you know, between the people who endure terrible suffering and torture, trauma, and do make something beautiful out of that, and those who just simply don't have the conditions to recover. Because it's not really so much our ability or lack of ability or our strength or lack of strength. It's more our fortune in who we can keep company with and in receiving the teachings of the Dhamma. So there should be no judgment there at all, but we do need to make those conditions accessible to everybody. And unfortunately, there's so much inequality in the world. There is so much discrimination, racism, sexism, transgenderism. I don't know if that's a thing, but basically we can't tolerate any of that if we want to make these opportunities available to everybody. And that's really what a monastery should be. And I think this is maybe where the bhikkhuni sangha can have an impact because as women we have experienced a lot of discrimination within unfortunately buddhist monasticism and also general society i mean many of you will know that you know you have to always be that bit better than a male counterpart or you know your your voice isn't heard or given credibility in the same way and for women we just don't have the opportunities to train for years in the forest with great masters I am super, super fortunate that I've had the chance to do that for some time with Ajahn Brahm. And even though I'm over here trying to start things up, we still have, I still have a lot of contact and teachings and support. And I feel that because I have that benefit, that blessing in my life, I want to share it. I want to do something with it. And however much strength I have, it's usually not coming from me. It's coming from the support around me. But I want to share that and make it possible for women and men and non-binary people and all people, whoever you are, to be able to benefit from what we're doing. So although we talk about bhikkhuni monastery, bhikkhuni monastery, you might think, why? You know, there's one bhikkhuni <laughs> in the country. It's really a place that we can have spiritual friendship and a place where hopefully you can feel safe. So we're quite lucky in a sense that we're not bound by tradition in the same way that many of the monks' monasteries are. You know, we don't have to cater to a particular um, group of people or, you know, do things the Thai way or the Burmese way, but we can actually do things the Buddhist way. We can go back to the early Buddhist texts and we can, you know, learn what the Buddha really wanted us to do, which was to have equality and to have democracy in these communities. And to teach the Dhamma, you know, in line with those teachings of the early Buddhist texts. So um, it's for everybody. And I really want to uh, encourage you to be involved and to keep contact because we have a few volunteers in the room now, actually probably 20 odd people. And we just had the most fantastic volunteer meeting in the little Vihara, which is in Ifli village, not far from here, just on the, it's still in Oxford actually, within the Ring Road. And it's a small place, but just this week, Myself and Ajahn Brown were coming down on the train from one of the events, Birmingham? Yeah, Liverpool. Liverpool, yeah. Liverpool, where we met Ajahn's Scouser roots. So he's a Scouser, actually, <laughs> with a yeah. posh, a sort of posh London accent-ish. Okay. And uh, <laughs> on the way down, we were just thinking, oh, it's going to be hard. I was thinking, it's going to be hard. We need more funds. And Ajahn's saying, you can get a loan. I was thinking, oh, no, I don't want to be in debt, whatever. And then quickly, I changed my attitude and said, right, let's just look what's there. And we looked online and found this property in Boar's Hill, and I went to see it like two days later with Ajahn Brahm. I just found them up there and then on the train, went to see it and thought, wow, this is like the most suitable thing we've found in eight years of trying to start this project. And it's almost within reach. And for anyone who is local, I need your help as well, because it may be that to get this place, we need to do a, a purchase. I can't do that. I can't sell and buy houses as a nun. <laughs> so I need volunteers, maybe solicitors, <laughs> and also a good dose of good karma, good karmic results coming through. So as Ajahn says, anything's possible, and I feel up for going for this. Ajahn thinks we should. So it may well be that we get a, a larger place that you can all come and meditate and uh, offer food to the sangha, to the monastics. We can invite more monastics for longer stays and hopefully build up something beautiful so that you don't have to depend just on a public talk or on a retreat even but you can actually integrate that into a lifestyle and stay as guests. So it's for everybody and every little counts. You know, it's not that everybody has to give like loads of funds. You can give your time, you can give a small amount per month, even, you know, a quid 
or a coffee, the price of a coffee, will get us a long way if many people chip in. And that's the beauty of community, you know. I look around me every day and see the walls of the vihara that I'm now in. It's a four-bedroom terrace. And uh, it's not just a four-bedroom terrace, you know. Every little thing in there is a gift. It's actually just a gift. It's the kindness and goodness of human beings surrounding me. And that proves to me every day that really there's a lot of goodness in this world. So hopefully you can be part of that in some way. You can come to our other talks. Uh, I'm doing some retreats, one in Sheffield, New Year retreat for Sheffield Insight. It's all on the website. I'm teaching in America and Norway, <laughs> but we do want to do more locally. So it's about building community here as well and organizing stuff when Ajahn Brahm cannot be there for me to do, for other nuns to do, because it is different hearing from different people, regardless of gender. Gender is one aspect, but we're all different. We all express the Dhamma in different ways. So um, I've been well conditioned, I think, brainwashed by Ajahn Brahm, so it'll be similar but without so many <laughs> stories no jokes. and jokes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> it can be covered up in different ways. So uh, I encourage you to be involved, and um, you can see our leaflets outside. We have, like, uh, website stuff, Zoom sessions that we do most weeks, meta meditation, sort of discussions that are very alive and real, you know, about, about you, really. It's a discussion, so it's not me giving a lecture at all. It's bringing the Buddha's teachings to life. What else do we have? Volunteer roles. <laughs> website help. We seem to have got a few more, web, bit more website help. But this started from nothing, so I was doing everything, and we need uh, to expand. So it's not just about getting a bigger place, it's about having the people to you know, keep this thing going so we can really spread the, the teachings and welcome all of you there. So I think that's... Uh, a lot from my side, so you can find all the uh, wonderful volunteers outside with the information and opportunities to give and be involved. And um, thanking Ajahn Brown once again, as I do every day. Um, cheers. <laughs> sorry? Cheers. Cheers, cheers Ajahn. <laughs> cheers. We had to do the cheers with cold water. All right, we'll have tea later. But uh, it's been quite an auspicious trip so far, so hopefully, yeah we can move ahead with this uh, purchase. And if it's not this time, it'll be next time. So it's a win-win, nothing to lose in trying. So thank you, Ajahn, again, for your just incredible spiritual friendship, planting seeds all over the place, and hopefully one will sprout in England on Boar's Hill. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you very much. And thank you to everybody here and our wonderful volunteers and trustees who are here as well. Thank you. All right, I think it's time to end. Do you want to say a last word or? Is that it? Have I said enough? Oh, he's gone speechless. Come on then. I've run out of energy. No, thank you all for coming. Very nice to see you all. And thank you. If I said anything which was wrong, please forgive me. Anything which is right, please praise, praise Ajahn, uh, uh, Ajahn Ayachanda. <laughs> I, that's called passing the buck. That's nice. You passed the good buck. Yeah, why not? Sadu, sadu, sadu. Ooh.